hear from tomorrow, I hope, um, with some concerns about um, the probation proposal and the good time proposal. And I'm trying to understand how they figure out when they're sentencing somebody for programming, and maybe somebody today from corrections could help me understand when you set, when somebody's being sentenced for programming, how does the Department of Corrections inform the court? DOC programming, so that, those are some of the questions. And those were the concerns of the state's attorneys. They're also concerned about probation for the same reason. If somebody fails in the program. Thank you. Okay. Um, Brynn, do you want to just walk quickly through the changes and then we'll hear from Commissioner Baker and others? You want to do it from there? We're, we're kind of crowded. Yeah, maybe it'd be better if you kept held yeah. your seat. That'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so for the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. So we're talking about draft 4.2 um, of the Justice Reinvestment Bill, and I'll just preface this by saying that I sent out um, a draft 4.1 on Monday, and so I, this draft 4.2 does incorporate some of the feedback that I got from some stakeholders, but um, I didn't hear from everyone, so I'll just leave that as it is. So the first changes, everything is in yellow highlight. Um, all the new sections are oh, in yellow highlight. for us, they're in gray. Or gray, okay. Um, so the first two are on page two. These are um, some additional findings that came from um, the Justice Center's presentation. The first is, um, they're both statistics about the sentence prison population and returns on furlough. And we also have some additional language on page three, two new. Um, these are not findings. This is sort of the purpose section. Mm -hmm. So this is all session law. It wouldn't go into the green books. It would just be in the bill itself. Do you want us to comment as well? Yeah. Um, Brent, I'm just wondering if it might make sense to have a comment after a community on line two, page three. OK. I will, sure, I'll ask our, our editors to take a look at that. Okay. Okay, so the next session is compassionate release. Um, the, lang the new language on the bottom of page three just provides that, um, puts a limitation on how frequently a petition can be filed by an inmate. So this language is, um, I think this comes from our expungement statute, which just provides that a person um, can bring a petition only every four months unless a shorter duration is authorized by the court. Um, new language on page four um, provides that the state's attorney or the attorney general is required to give notice of a petition for compassionate release to any victim who's associated with the offense. Um, and it provides some language about what that notice has to look like um, by any reasonable means to the victim's last known address. <clears throat> and then upon request of the victim, um, the state's attorney or the attorney general has to give notice of, the, of any hearing on the petition and inform the victim of the outcome of the petition. So, is it similar to what we do with uh, post-conviction parole? Release? It's similar to what we do for post-conviction release. And parole, yes. Yeah. So, Bryn, the, the way it would work is um, the petition has been filed the AG or the state's attorney give written notice to the victim, then the victim has to proactively ask to be notified after that point of the hearing? For any, yes, moving forward, the victim would have to um, let the prosecutor know that they want to be notified of the outcome in any further hearings. Okay. <clears throat> um, some new link, there, you're going to see this throughout the bill. There's a couple of options in brackets. Um, this is just based on some feedback I heard from stakeholders. So this provides that if the court does grant the hearing, um, either the attorney general or the state's attorney or the Department of Corrections so shall appear as a party for the state. Um, I think you may hear from some people on their opinions about that. <clears throat> if you turn to page five, we're now, um, this is, uh, we're still in compassionate release. This um, changes the, the 
The last draft required that the person be 65 years of age or older and suffer from a chronic or serious medical condition. So this takes out that age uh, limitation and just provides that if a person suffers from a chronic or serious medical condition and is experiencing um, deteriorating mental or physical health, um, that person would be eligible to petition for compassionate release. Mm, eligible to petition. Yes. All right. right. But we're just walking oh, through sure. so that um, unless there's a technical, okay. I, I okay. prefer to just walk through okay. and then hear testimony. <laughs> Um, it adds some additional requirements for the court to find, so the um, court can grant a petition if, the, and here's additional language, um, if compassionate release is appropriate, and also there's an appropriate placement and supports available for that person in the community. And the new, the highlighted language of subdivision D there uh, just provides that if the court grants a petition, it can, it can impose a term of probation, and it removes some language there that um, allows the court to change the duration of the incarceration. Okay. Um, the next change is on page six. This just adds a new section to the compassionate release subchapter that uh, provides that the court can appoint counsel um, if the petitioner is unable to afford his or her own counsel. And then it talks about costs and expenses. And this language comes directly from the post-conviction relief chapter. Committee members have issues with the policy or want further clarification. We can do that tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, there may be comments from the different witnesses yeah. today about some of this. Okay. If we turn to page eight, we're now moving into the probation section. Um, so the changes here came um, from some testimony that you heard last week about proposals, um, policy proposals for this section. So I think that this first language here on page eight um, was a recommendation from the Office of the Defender General. That all terms of probation set by the court shall be for a specific duration that can't exceed the statutory maximum term of imprisonment for the offense, so no indefinite probation terms. If you turn to page nine, you'll see that we've struck some language that provides that a court could set um, an indefinite period of probation. And then page 12, um, this is the language that provides that credit. So if a person serves their probation um, without violating, they receive credit towards that specific <coughs> sentence. Um, so this changes the language here, provides that a person gets a day of credit um, towards their minimum sentence for each day that they serve probation without um, a violation filed. And it specifies that um, those days cease to accrue on the date that any violation is actually filed with the court. <clears throat> and it provides that that credit ceases to accrue on the date that the violation is filed. And then um, it also provides that once a person has accrued um, credit equal to the maximum term of their suspended sentence, then the court um, shall terminate their probation and discharge the person from probation. Um, Brim, is there, so somebody has a violation filed, they stop receiving credit, um, is it possible for them to go back on the status where they are receiving credit? Um, Yes, I don't think that this, there's no specific language to that, but I don't. There's nothing that prohibits that. Um, okay. So if we did, if we wanted to make it clear that they, they could go back to receiving credit, then I could put in some language that makes that clear. Uh, look, look, I, I need to look, um, look, flag that. Okay. Please. I've made a note. <laughs> Okay, um, now we're going to move to the presumptive parole section. So I'm on page 15. <clears throat> so this provides that, um, this, this is language that comes from the Compassionate Release Bill. I thought we decided to take that out. We, did, we took out the 55 um, language and we left in the 65. Okay, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay. So the, the question here is whether that goes, well, I, it's, Right now, it's in the um, regular parole section, yeah. so the person would be eligible for a parole hearing rather than in the presumptive yeah. parole. Okay. So, um, moving to page 16, now we're in the presumptive parole part of the statute. Um, 
So the changes here are that a person uh, is eligible for presumptive parole um, <coughs> if they have no outstanding warrants, detainers, commitments, or pending charges. Uh, the last draft you saw said for a listed crime. Good. So this just takes out the listed crime and says they don't have any outstanding charges for any crime. Um, and then if you go down to subdivision D here, it provides that if the person, the person has to be compliant with the conditions of their supervision um, for the entire period, if their term of supervision is 90 days or less, um, or if their term is longer than 90 days, then they have to have be compliant with the terms of their supervision for at least the 90 days prior. And then I've just made a note down here um, that I think the committee is thinking about whether or not they want this to apply to people who have committed anything but a listed crime or anything mm -hmm. but a Big 12 offense. So I just made a note of that there. Yep. Okay, next, if we turn to page 20, this is we're still in presumptive parole. And here we've um, looking at some new language um, that was contemplated by the parole board and the department. Um, so this provides that the department this sort of sets out the protocol. How are, how are people getting onto presumptive parole? How are they being recommended for presumptive parole? So this language provides that the department has to identify everybody who meets those criteria that we just talked about in the, in the previous section um, and refer those eligible inmates to the parole board at least 60 days prior to their elig eligibility date, which would be the date that they've reached their minimum. Um, and then the department shall recommend presumptive release for each of those eligible inmates to the parole board um, unless it makes a determination, and here we've got the standard of proof here, based on the preponderance of the evidence or clear and convincing evidence that um, neither one of these factors is true, that there's, or that there's a reasonable probability that the inmate can't be released or that the inmate is not <coughs> capable. So this puts in that um, burden of proof on the department um, that the department is the one for, that is required to ensure that neither of these risk factors is true before they recommend um, an inmate to the parole board for presumptive release. And then, I'm sorry, I'm going so fast. Is that, are we good so far? Um, page line eight, sub three A. This is what the parole board does after the department identifies and recommends people for presumptive release. So it provides the parole board has to conduct an administrative review of each of those um, eligible inmates that the department has identified within 30 days of their eligibility date. And the board can disqualify an inmate for presumptive release. Um, this, this is important for presumptive release and set up hearing. Um, if a victim, if the parole board identifies that there's a victim or victims that um, should be notified of the hearing and have an opportunity to participate. I'm just wondering about the language of the board must, may disqualify. Yeah, that, um, so this was, this is all drafted earlier this morning. There may be better word, wording here. Yeah, well, what I'm, what I'm thinking. We'll just go, I, I really want to walk through that. Okay. I, I thought you wanted to clarify technical. <coughs> okay, well, technical. So the idea is that they would no longer be eligible for presumptive relief, the presumptive release, that they would instead um, have a hearing in which a victim could participate. So there may be a better way to phrase this. Okay. Um, I could think about that. So. Um, and then the next subdivision, sub B, provides that the board shall conduct a parole hearing um, for each inmate who's identified as eligible by the department, but for whom the department has determined that one of those risk criteria is true. So um, if an if a inmate is el otherwise eligible, but um, the department's identified that there's a risk factor associated with that inmate, then the parole board has to conduct a hearing for that inmate. Excuse me. Okay. And we're on to page 24. Um, the highlighted language here, this is the medical furlough language. You heard some testimony that this, um, the, the department should, should retain its authority to um, place an inmate on medical furlough. So that was removed in the previous version and it's just put back in in this version. Um, if you turn to page 28, this is that new status of community supervision furlough. Um, the previous version 
provided that the department and a member of the parole board should make any determination of a violation. Um, and that language has just been changed. So no, it's just the department now, not a member of the parole board. Um, and then if you look at page 29, this is um, some, this was just put in this morning. This is an idea to institute some due process for any interrupt of community supervision furlough. This provides that the department, if the department interrupts or um, revokes <coughs> furlough for an inmate for a certain duration of time, either six months or longer or 90 days or longer, following a technical violation of conditions as opposed to if the um, offender commits a new crime, then the department is required to notify um, the Office of the De Defender General of that interrupt. I thought we were talking about five days, but okay. I'll put that in the bracket. I'll put that too. <laughs> okay. And I think that um, that may be it. The other thing I just wanted to point out, um, there, are, there are additional changes coming to the section 19, the racial disparities report section. No. So I don't I don't know if we want to walk through that just yet. No, we're waiting to hear on yes, the uh, Center for Justice Research. Yeah. Um, I think that's the right term. Um, and then, so the last thing I want to point out is just that reintegration furlough appeared in your last version of the bill um, with some amendments to it, and that section of law has now been repealed. Okay. Hello, this is Cassandra from the Justice Hi, Cassandra, Dick Sears, and we've got many folks here in the room, and uh, thank you for taking time to listen in. If you need thank to, you so much. If you need to speak, just holler. I won't be able to see you raise your hand. <laughs> we'll do. Commissioner Baker. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for the record, I'm Jim Baker. I'm the interim commissioner of corrections. And um, appreciate the opportunity then to come in again, Senator, to, to, uh, to uh, give feedback on the latest version. I think what we just heard, uh, there's nothing there that we have, we have any issues with. Um, as far as the change. Um, one of the things, this is some technical stuff that I, that I would make some suggestions on, is um, there's several versions of talking about medical furlough. And the language used uh, may, not, may not be consistent with what we're describing. Serious medical condition, terminal illness, I would ask that that gets defined, because that can become very tricky for us. Mm -hmm. um, from a standpoint of um, you know us determining what serious illness is, and I you know the language is good. It's just that several it's described several different ways throughout the bill. Now I haven't looked at the latest version to see if the language is consistent throughout. And I would just ask that maybe bring you take a look at that just to, just to make sure that language stays consistent. Um, General, general observation, again, I'll repeat what I said earlier, is that this is very helpful for us. The good time is very helpful for us. Um, and, and cleaning up the furlough statuses is very good for us from, a, from an internal process of processing. So it's very helpful for us um, as far as us being able to manage, especially the highest risk folks. Um, so for, for us, um, we're, we're appreciative of that. Um, I do think, I want Dale just to explain one point on, on uh, at what point does good time stop and start? That's the issue, right? Yes. I would just ask Dale to kind of touch on this because there may be an unintended consequence in the language that could reward someone at a higher risk <clears throat> for bad behavior. Uh, but but I'll, let, I'll let Dale explain that if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, for the record, Dale Crook, I'm the Director of Field Services for the Vermont Department of Corrections. Um, so how, how the probation language is written right now, they're getting, they'd be getting credit until um, a violation is filed. Um, we would uh, re we recommend that, that that language change until an arrest warrant is filed because supervision is still going to be continuing with that offender. Um, we don't want to... One way, one reason is that that language, the new language that I just suggested, matches all of our other legal statuses, that they still get credit on their sentence while they're being supervised, even though there may be pending violations. Um, once a warrant is filed, someone's absconds or leaves, 
the time stops at that point. So it's consistent with all of our other legal statuses that we're trying to manage. Another reason is we want to create a kind of a, we don't want to reward bad behavior. So if someone does something really bad and we arrest them and lodge them in jail, they'll get credit for that. If someone doesn't do something quite as bad and we just give them a citation to appear a couple of months down before court to address it, then they would stop getting credit. And I don't think we want to set up that dynamics. And a lot of times during that situation is where the probation officer and the offender are working together, they kind of correct that behavior. Just because someone's violated a condition of probation um, doesn't mean we, we stop working with them and supervising them. A lot of times those violations of probation can lead to behavior change and we'll actually supervising them at a more intense rate, the, the correct behavior, before they go before the judge. I'm looking at page 12. There is also the situation where someone is brought in on a probation violation complaint, but the case is de minimis in some fashion, so parties agree we're going to note the violation and continue. And I don't know whether the intention is to allow them to continue getting credit or not, because they technically have violated, but well, he, he did in a slightly different way. Or something to think Have about. Have they been arrested? They would still get credit because once, even as detained, they're getting credit toward their sentence. So, um, are you confusing me? This is talking about probation <coughs> credit, correct? And not credit. Well, I suppose the same thing. If you're in jail, are you getting credit for your probation term? Yeah, you're getting credit toward your sentence. So how how so in, in the way that the new language is written, yes, um, because they're getting credit toward their sentence on probation now. What, what we need to understand, and what the state's attorneys need to understand, is how does that affect programming, whether it be in the community or in the in the facility. So the violation component, not so much. What would matter is I think what um, the state's attorneys and I think Pepper earlier is they're looking at what do what kind of sentence do we impose on someone? Is that correct? Um, and what that would entail is, because they're not getting credit to probation, um, a lot of times they'll have shorter terms, but with a longer max. Uh, no, a longer max, longer term with a shorter maximum. I'm getting confused here, sorry. Um, where they would be doing programming at a longer period past their max, could be past their maximum date, until they completed whatever program they were required. Yes. So, so how this plays out, um, the more serious the offense and the longer the sentence really has less of an impact on this, as we'll be getting credit toward it anyway and the sentences are, so, are pushed so far out. Um, the shorter sentences, I think the, the sentencing bodies are going to have the um, understand that the term and the max, and I think that the Federal General identified this, um, should be relatively closer together. Um, and that way you, you don't want to have someone um, sort of a situation where they may ex hit their term or hit their maximum sentence, but their term's still out, farther out, where they actually have to violate in order to be done with supervision. We don't want to sit up a situation like that. Is that, is that helping you, son? Yeah, I think so. I'm still a little, uh, I'm not sure. It, it raises the question of if we want good time to be, and that's where we also need, I mean, this probation thing is sort of like good time. So if you screw up, you shouldn't get the day for the day for that month or whatever. Maybe it should be operated in the same sense so that you know people are getting a certain credit towards their probation term for not do, screwing up, but if they screw up during that month, they don't get credit for that month. You know, it seems like a cleaner way to do it. And the good time, you say you wanted to refine that some to make sure there's not unintended consequences. <clears throat> and we do too, but it seems like, so guy A, goes through, does everything he, he or she is supposed to do on probation and gets credit day for a day, B, screws up repeatedly on probation and gets the same amount of credit. 
doesn't seem to fit. And that, that does not, to, it's not to say that we should, you know, violate his, pro, his or her probation, but it seems like we ought to be rewarding what is acceptable behavior and not rewarding unacceptable behavior. So I think we should really look at it similar to the good time. That would also match with if they do get violated and they're put into jail, they're getting credit at seven days off that minimum, right? Correct. So if I may, sir, this is, this is not, it's a different, a different concept. It's not good time. They're getting credit. It would be the same as parole. So parole, as it's written now, is not getting good time credit. Um, now, the situation you identified earlier, someone's doing exceptionally well, doing everything they need to go. There's other parts of legislation that's already been implemented, such as midpoint review, that actually would reward that person at a, at a greater rate. So they could actually be recommended for a discharge at the midpoint of their term or their sentence that takes into account that overly good behavior. Okay. <coughs> if you're okay, I'm, yes. Ooh, uh, hard. We're, we're good with the language about when the, when the credit begins okay. with. Um, All right. <coughs> okay, any other areas? Um, I, I think on, 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 on the appropriation piece. Yeah. Um, you know, I just think I want to be on the record, Senator, that um, you know, we've been working on housing issues for a while inside corrections. We recognize the fact that um, we need to do more work uh, to, to stop some of the furlough, for example, by violations that occur around housing issues. And um, I just, you know, I want to caution, you, you all know this, but I just want to caution the committee about one-time funding and the expectation of what the return on that one-time funding is. And the expectation on corrections that somehow we're going to solve this housing challenge that we've had for a very long time uh, with with a shot of one-time funding. Uh, it's going to take a while, you know, before we see that reinvestment of the money and the reduction of beds around the issue of someone loses housing. Because even though it can be said that it's a technical violation when somebody loses housing, you know, the staff advises me that. Many times it's just more than housing. There's an underlying issue as to why they lost the housing, and it appears as if they've been violated for losing housing. Because housing, you know, we all know this, housing is one of those stability situations that allow people to do well in the community. I don't see this as, uh, there's a difference of opinion here. And I don't know where the majority of the committee is, but I don't see this as one time, I see it as one time money a use of $2 million of surplus funds. I don't see it as a one-time appropriation because the expectation is that you will reduce the cost of out-of-state placements by even more than $2 million in, by 2025. So what we're trying to do is in advance to start reinvesting now for what we expect will be savings in actually some of those savings will occur in FY21. More, if you look at the projection by CSG for FY22, 23, 24, and 25, you see it continuing to rise. So the idea here is, can we kick some up stuff up front money in to actually accelerate the savings? So I realize that the administration usually opposes these sorts of things, and I'm fine with that. Um, but I, my hope is that we'll be able to convince the appropriations committees in the Senate and the House that this is really an investment, not uh, a one-time kick to a bunch of programs that we think will do good. I didn't want to insinuate, Senator, that I was thinking, I knew what you were thinking. Uh, I, I did say to staff when we went over this, yep. I am in the position of representing the administration on the financial We realize that. Right. Um, with that said, I just wanted to be on the record that um, it isn't going to be, you're not going to see massive savings in 2021. It's going to take a while to get to 2025. Mm -hmm. And just be clear on what the expectations on corrections is, because after I'm gone, 
I don't, I don't, I don't want to see it come back on corrections that there was the same as in FY22, for example, that people expected, that I think it's going to take a while to build up that capacity to really impact it. And with that said, the staff clearly realizes that we've been working on this for a while and that we do have to push it. We do have to push it to the next level mm -hmm. to get to where we need to. Well, if I look at the chart here, the expectation is by FY22, potential averted between 2.3 million and 3 million and 3 million. Mm -hmm. So that's a potential averted uh, of savings. So if you just save 2.3 million in FY22, um, um, you'd actually be 300,000 ahead if you do the minimum that they've projected. I was trying to find my copy of the Justice Reinvestment, the first Justice Reinvestment in Vermont, but I, I know that it was done um, in a way that appeared to, um, I keep getting New Hampshire for some reason. <laughs> I don't care about New Hampshire in this case. May I ask a question? Robert? Yeah, go ahead. Would you, um, on page 29 of the, this version, it seems we have a, a difference of five days or six months or longer. I, I mean, what page is that, sir? Uh, it's uh, page 29. It's the, um, if the department interrupts an offender's community su supervision for four, six months or longer, 90 days or longer, and then Senator Sears just said five days or longer following a technical violation, they notify, you'd notify the defender general. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on, that's a, we're talking about five days, six months, or 90 days. What, where would you put the, put it? At five days? Well, or? with five days, we would probably be, it takes longer for that for our due process hearing to go through. So we'd be notifying generally the, probably the, the prisoner's rights office for every time someone is lodged. Um, we can do that. It's just a hugely administrative burden. We're mm -hmm. just sending paperwork constantly. Um, what we're trying to, when we worked with CSG in, in, on this language, was to give kind of a clue or a flag to the prisoner's rights office when it would appear the department might be overly heavy-handed. Um, many of our sanctions were for up to one year. What this would do, we would recommend uh, six months, because that seems like a, a fair amount of time, that if um, interrupts or violations are over six months, we notify the, the Prisoner's Rights Office. And at that point, the Prisoner's Rights Office can um, basically follow up and investigate or, or, or proceed with that. So you would, but you notify them right away that it's going to be a six month, not after the six months. Correct. Yeah. So okay. What, what we'd have, we'd okay. Have a, I see. So we have a central staffing yeah. process. So at the end of that staffing process, a determination is made. And if that determination is for whatever time frame, we we're, were there, let's say six months, then we would notify prisoner's rights office right away, saying this is the reason, this is the, you know, the offender, this is the reason, this is our justification. And at that point they can, um, and they can do that now, but that just gives them an opportunity to look at the case and they say we want to challenge or it just, it just, it's more of a transparent system. And you would go with six months rather than the 90 days. I clearly hear you say you don't want five days, but. Yeah, I mean. It's just an administrative, I mean, yeah. so we okay. can live with 90 days, I believe the first six. Okay, just wondering. Okay. Thank you. Um, keep moving right ahead. Where else are we, uh, Commissioner? I, 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 think, I, I think we touched on, on the issues there. <coughs> What's that? <coughs> Something for all right. Um, do you feel comfortable, Ellen or Cassandra, with the projection for FY22? I was just talking about that with Monica. I mean, that's so far I've been updating Ed, our researcher, on all of the changes, and he has said that where things stand as of last night, and I don't think anything has substantially changed this morning, <coughs> all of the modeling would remain the same. Um, but something that Monica and I were just talking about is how critical that implementation period in 2021 is of really getting to a place where things are operating the way they're intended. And David actually testified to this last week, too, of, of the the proof will come in how effectively these processes are put in place so that by 2022, those beds are really being reduced at that number that's projected. So that's something that we would be working with 
DOC on um, as soon as possible, and DOC and the Coal Board and other relevant agencies. Um, well, I, I would point out in 2008 that the reinvestment was basically in probation and in things like diversion and um, you know, we, we actually have invested heavily in diversion in the state and other things that came out of the 2008. And that resulted in a reduction of over 400 to 500 people out of state. So those savings, if considered as reinvestment, um, and you also have a continued reinvestment in some community programs, so that have been cut back in recent years. If you don't reinvest the funds, you won't get the results. And I don't. And I'm wondering how you get the results if you don't start to reinvest before you make the changes. If the programs aren't there, then I, I would think it's doomed to fail. And so that's why I'm, I'm going to argue against yes. the yep. not funding this. Our models are on. Uh, there are three L three main policies plays that that inform those projections. The first is earn good time. The second, to a less, much lesser degree, is, is presumptive parole. Um, the third is different assumptions around reducing recidivism and revocations to prison. And the way that you get to any of those assumptions, whether it's a 5% reduction up to 20%, is um, certainly by changing process to a certain point, but also it's connecting people with services in their community, and that only comes from an upfront investment. So we don't think you can get anywhere to those savings without some initial money. Thank you for that. So, so but I'm glad I took you off on this course, Senator. Yeah. I, I apologize, but I guess your, your point about the point I was trying to make was about the reinvestment. Right. I, I use I use my old term from state government, one time money. And well, it is one time money. Right. But, but my point about if money isn't reinvested, you're not going to escalate. No. You're not going to escalate the savings. That's what. And I'm trying to protect the Department of Corrections. From becoming the scapegoat for that value. Right. And that's so, why, that's how Kansas failed. Right. They chose not to reinvest, they chose just to save. Right. And judges were different. Huh? The judges were pretty tricky in Kansas, too. Yeah. Really? Yeah, well, they've got the chiefs now. You know, Senator, somebody made a suggestion to me that I should have called you yesterday, and knowing that you were a 49er fan, I, just, I didn't have the heart to call you, sir. No, but I, now I know where the Chiefs are from. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, only, the only other piece that we have that just got brought to my attention is, and I'm looking at the older version because I, I didn't slide to this. Uh, we, uh, under the per perceptive parole, we would ask for the clear and convincing evidence. Um, we would ask for the clear and convincing what? evidence language. It's, it's on page 20. 20, line 7. Talks about Actually, it's on page 21. Is it? Line, line 1 through 3. Actually, I think Matt Valerio oh. made the same suggestion. Yeah. Amazing that Matt and I agree on that. Right? Do you both want clear and convincing? That's my note. Wow. I'm going to have coffee in that. I, I think I'll just look at my staff for a minute, but I think we touched on the points. Um, you know, and my last comment, Senator, is, is that um, the Department of Corrections is fully in and is, is ready to move forward, um, looking at our systems to do better, to have better outcomes. Um, we, I believe we do great work now, but um, I think it's, it's time to work with the different stakeholders um, to even have better outcomes to provide better public safety. We know that, and um, we're, 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 we're all in to do it. So, I, I know you have some questions around programming that you talked about. Yeah, I, the question, when, when courts are fashioning sentencing, and it'll get even more confusing with good time reestablished, I think. Uh, they're usually looking in many cases, I suppose it's to make the judge feel better or the prosecutor or whomever feel better that they've targeted this person for programming. But in many cases, you hear of, particularly with short-term incarceration, I mean less than a year or maybe a little more than a year, where they're looking for the programming, but they, they rely on information, and I don't know where they're getting it from, and it seems to be different in county to county. And, Senator Benning raised uh, his, his, his client, I guess, not constituent, or maybe both, 
who gets uh, needs nine months of programming gets a year's sentence, so they can match the programming with the. Um, and how? And if you're doing that with good time, and you assume that the person's going to get seven times twelve months, how many? You know, now are we going to just add that to the sentence? How often? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah. yeah, I don't think we have an answer. I mean, I, I think, Senator, one of the things that when I, when I staffed this morning with staff on coming in today, I think there's a lot of things that we have to, we have to take this information back and start working on. How do you resolve an issue like that, right? Um, because if, 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 if you agree on a six-month sentence as a defense attorney with a prosecutor, but it takes nine you months can hand to program. This out to other people too. Right? It's almost punishing the person no. that they can't get programmed yeah, tomorrow. because okay. well, the sentence website. doesn't fit the programming instead of the sentence fitting what the judge thinks is appropriate for the offense that's in front of them. Am I capturing that accurately? Or figure out a way to have the programming start move in the facility and move to the community and then move to the community while mm -hmm. still in it because I'm talking specifically about risk reduction program. Mm -hmm. Understood. It starts quarterly. Mm -hmm. So a defendant has to be sentenced whenever they're being sentenced. They can't start the day of risk reduction program and commence it. And so common you end up with a year on the minimum in order to accommodate the nine months. It's not mm -hmm. going to start for a couple of months. So we're basically warehousing. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I may say something right now that staff's going to poke me in the back. But with the good time, accelerate, with acceleration of good time, it could even make it work out. Am I, am I right? Yeah, you've got to have something that starts in the facility immediately and lets them out to finish it. But if you can't start it immediately, then there's got to be a, a philosophy change that they can actually get the programming in the community and still be safe. And I don't know if you're going to cross that bridge, but good luck when you get there. But 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 I think we have to we have to walk up to that bridge and figure out how to cross it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we have the answer today, but we will go back and start talking about this because a lot of what we think is good in this, like good time, you know, it's kind of interesting. So states attorneys may not see it the way we see it on good time. We see good time as a way to manage folks mm -hmm. to a better place, right? right? And so I, I think I can't give you that answer today, and I don't think the staff can. But but I promise you, maybe on the language around coming back in April to talk to you about where we're moving forward, that we can put this on the list of things we need to talk about. Is that yeah. what I handed out to the committee, or what Peggy handed out to the committee, is the 2008 issue brief by the Justice Center on our, the projections and everything, um, if you reinvest it. The same discussion that we're having today. Peggy's gonna post this on the website. She's got a couple of extra copies here. But I think it's instructive to look back at what we did and how accurate they really were. They projected a drop of 436 beds. It's posted already. Thank you, thank you. And, and you'll see. You dropped more. And we actually drop more, but yeah. so if you're looking at, the, you know, will we get to the minimum of 2.3 million if we do the investments? I would suggest that they're pretty accurate. Kansas, which I did point out, was a, is a state that chose to go through justice reinvestment and for whatever reason didn't reinvest, um, and they would say, well, it's a failure. Justice reinvestment was a failure in Kansas, but. It may be their own failure to, to follow through with the reinvestment of the savings. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'll say on this is that BJA, which funds the implementation assistance that's available for states that pass justice reinvestment legislation, has become more focused in recent years for that reason on states um, being eligible for that only if they've identified how and when and where concretely they will be reinvesting. Um, so that is very much something that they look to because this has become a pretty clear indicator of a measure of success or failure on whether or not the policies and are. So the language in our appropriations is that? I, I can double check, but I feel like that would be that would be well received by BJA. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Commissioner, anything else before we I, turn it over to some of your staff? Um, I, I'm good. Um, unless you have some questions for me. 
I, just, uh, uh, I think you've answered most of my questions, but uh, go ahead. Dale, if, if you have anything additional? The uh, only thing I would add, sir, is uh, there's a couple of decision points around presumptive parole around uh, the Big 12 <laughs> and listed offenses. Uh, we would prefer listed offenses. The, the Big 12 is, is um, it has a lot more victim impact. Um, and it's in presumptive parole is not preventing someone from getting parole. It's kind of, it, it, it's, it, it will um, move certain things quicker without administrative burdens. Um, I think having victims the opportunity to be heard um, and that is mainly captured with the listed offenses, with the Big 12. Um, it's, it's not really in the, in the titles that department in the courts, as far as criminal courts like this are used, it's, it's Title 33. It's, it's a different title, it's a different listed. Help, help me understand something, mm -hmm. and then maybe both of you or anyone in the room can answer it. So we take the women, for example. We noted that there were a lot of low-risk women incarcerated in Chicago something like 40%. Now, many of them may have committed a big fall offense, or may even, you know, at least a listed offense. So if they're ineligible for presumptive parole, we're then focusing on the, on the offense and not the risk. And I thought we were trying to move more towards a risk-based risk system than an offense-driven system. Once they're incarcerated, obviously, you know, you're going to get a certain sentence for certain crimes, and, and that's just, you know, the community and the public look at it that way. But if inside we're looking at risk, and we don't at some point include everybody in the eligibility, I mean, how do we deal with that? We're still going to have low-risk people incarcerated for longer periods than they need to be. And, I, and some, you know, high-risk offenders are in the non-listed offense category. So we're going to be, uh, it's just, cause, did you want to? Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I mean, on that piece, I think um, just, I keep coming back to when we, when we think about, or when I think about the female population, how many of them are incarcerated on revocations or furlough interrupts. Mm -hmm. um, so that's still the majority of the reason why women are incarcerated today is because of some sort of failure on supervision. So I think everything we're talking about, including an additional due process layer on the furlough interrupts, but also community, tra you know, transitional housing will be enormous, um, community programming, a lot of that I think will have, and Ed is going to specifically be modeling all of this out for the women as well, specific to show kind of what that might look like. Um, the other thing I would say just more broadly to what Dale is saying about presumptive uh, parole, I think um, in conversations with the parole board, the addition of the language here around allowing the board the opportunity to call for a hearing for people if there is a victim would mean that in the case of Big 12, all but Big 12, there would be that would almost automatically mean all of those folks are getting a hearing anyway. Everyone right now pretty much is getting out at their minimum on furlough. So we see both of these policies as, as sort of continuing to allow people to be released at their minimum, um, putting them into different populations, but really critically connecting them with community services um, so that they're not coming back quite so often or so quickly. I, one of the findings is that furlough is a failure. One of the things in the bill is furlough continues. And I, but I, but I, I think Senator, furlough continues, right? Yeah. But it's it's much for us. It's kind of whittled down to a much more manageable, with the understanding that we see the data on the technical violations. And, I, and what I would like to add about the conversation about the women's population is is that. Secretary Smith has charged all the AHS agencies. We've started a working group to bring back the 2005 Incarcerated Women's Project um, to start really taking a hard look at. And this is where I think the work with the Council of State Governors will be helpful in this conversation, especially around the issue of uh, informed trauma, uh, those relationships, crossroads between trauma and, and how women end up incarcerated and what kind of supports they need. So that conversation started separate from this conversation, but clearly it's gonna cross paths at some point in our, in our work 
hopefully in the future with uh, with CSG. So um, I, I, I know furlough has been identified as a problem, but from our perspective, what's in that bill has helped us better think about our role in the furlough process. Of course, that makes sense. 100. 100. Yeah, 100. 30, 32 different clarity. Yeah, exactly. I think it's also the mm -hmm. first of potential many steps towards a really different system. And this still signifies a, a pretty big shift for where people are moving and what the state's doing. It doesn't need to be the sum total of what the legislature or, or lawmakers decide they want the system to look like. But I think it's a first um, pretty big step in the direction of really rethinking community supervision and how it's designed and implemented. Um, and, and we still feel comfortable that this incremental approach is the one that allows all of the different agencies and entities and places where people may go to be really measured and implemented with um, with care and caution to make sure that it's it's working out the way that it's supposed to. Um, Mary Jane Ainsworth, Parole Board Director, just also wanted to put out there that not to lose sight that even though if somebody's not granted presumptive parole, there still is the regular minimum hearing process. So the offender is still going to go before the board, and sometimes those hearings more comes to light around the risk around all the factors, the victims. So I just don't want to lose sight on how valuable a hearing process can also be with some of these cases. Um, and that they can still, and the, as Chairman George testified to, the parole board has been using furlough as a crutch, and that is a cultural shift that we are starting to change. Great, anything else? I, I, I think the staff, I've represented the staff pretty well in our conversations, but if you obviously have questions for them, I know well, specifically for Annie and then uh, there. Absolutely. I don't know about Monica if she wants to comment, but Annie, you're, who can speak to the DV programming, domestic violence program? Monica. I can. Okay. That was one of the, you know, and I've been trying to find the slide, and I can't find David's slide on the domestic violence program. You can email it. Uh, would you? Because uh, that was one of the criticisms was mm -hmm. we seem to have lost our domestic violence programming. And maybe that's not true, or maybe David was wrong, or? So um, my name is Kim Bushy. I'm the Program Services Director for the Department of Corrections. So um, as you may remember, Senator, because I do believe that I testified in here when we started making this transition back in 2013-14, um, we started, um, I was tasked with re-examining the way we were delivering services and our adherence to the evidence. And we brought the University of Cincinnati here uh, more than once, several times actually, and they um, conducted a, a program evaluation tool called the Correctional Program Checklist, which is based out of a Canadian tool. In any case, part of what they represented in terms of what the department was delivering with um, domestic violence was we were delivering intensive domestic abuse program, um, which you may remember was part of a pre-approval, pre-approved treatment furlough. Okay, so it was part of PAF. Um, and um, it was for felony violence, felony domestic violence, so it was issue specific. And part of some of the things that the um, University of Cincinnati pointed out, not only about IDOP, but about all of our programs, um, was that we were not fully adhering to the risk need responsivity um, principles, and that by focusing on an offense-based system, the way that we were delivering services was based on the conviction and the offense, not based on risk and criminogenic needs. What we were seeing is that we were not, we had domestic abuse offenders, for example, who had a number of other criminogenic needs that we were not, as a department, addressing. We had no mechanism to address them. So, for example, as you may well know, um, domestic violence has several other criminogenic needs that have high correlates. So those high correlates include things like substance abuse, underemployment or unemployment, uh, financial challenges, um, sometimes mental health or learning disabilities. And so in our old system, we had no mechanism for addressing any of that. So we transitioned the way that we deliver services now. 
and um, pretty much fully transition into an integrated model where corrections education and um, where we have work uh, like BCI, uh, BCI or facility employment along with our, co our various curriculum. So we have like 10 different curriculum that we've selected that address different, that target different criminogenic needs. So some of them target antisocial thinking, some of them target your responsibility, some of them target coping skills and emotional regulation, um, and then we use corrections education to help us target learning disabilities, basic skill disabilities, um, and employment workforce readiness. So those that are able, we target um, industry certifications. That side is only in the facility because we don't have uh, uh, full campuses of corrections at or community, edu uh, community high school are not in the community anymore. But that's what the department has done. I think what um, Karen Transgard Scott has, re has um, referenced is that when the department made this transition, we um, provided a grant of about $100,000 to the Vermont Network uh, um, Against Domestic and Sexual Violence as part of that transition because we had been allocated, as part of our allocation, we had been in part supporting the, um, what was called at that point, the uh, Batter Accountability Coordinator. And so that money had, for a period of time, helped support that position. We provided bridge money 2014, I think it was 2014. It might have gone into 2015. I'm a little messy on my dates, but thereabouts. <clears throat> that um, amounted to about $100,000 to, to support the network in um, bridging into other um, financial resources and also to take a look at how they might be able to uh, support a, a certification process and build a broader system. And so um, what I think the network has found is that in, in the absence of a, of a state consistent allocation that was originally coming through the department, um, those uh, DVAP programs, which the department never paid for, they were always a fee for service in the community, but what happened was that that level um, struggled because they no longer had Spectrum, which was an overarching um, organization that had, had sort of created an infrastructure, both in providing IDAP, and in providing um, some training and, co and coordination for the... Um, that, that was the batter intervention program. Exactly. The so that, um, exactly. They did they run it statewide? I think. They did run it statewide. So, yeah. so they provided some training um, capacity through IDAP and through, I think, some other monies as well that helped support the network in, in supporting those um, community um, DV programs when both the department and then subsequently Spectrum um, changed, I mean we changed direction and then I think a year or so later um, Spectrum re-evaluated they sort of returned to their original mission which was youth, right, and they, they re-evaluated how they um, how they wanted to, or, you know, focus on their mission. Those two things I think then pulled out some resources that um, that the network had previously um, been able to, or that the state had previously been able to um, support community uh, batter intervention or community domestic abuse programs. So I think if I'm not, I think I'm accurately representing what Karen is referencing. Well, I'm referencing the slide that you'll all soon have a copy of from David Diamora from the um, Justice Center, but it basically says, Vermont's domestic violence community program is weakened by the current funding model, lack of state investment and support, and um, recidivism, uh, he's got domestic violence up 23%. 
Who's that from? David. David. Those yeah. are the conviction volumes. Conviction yeah. volume. Yeah. And um, between FY15 and FY19, um, and you know, he, he thinks there should be. Um, as soon as we get the copy, I'll, I'll hand it out to people. But um, Vermont no longer has a statewide domestic violence program coordinator. That's the position you were just talking about, <coughs> which he thinks should be put back in. Out of this 400,000, I don't know if 400,000 is enough. Um, I don't actually operate, nor have I ever operated that that program, sir. So I don't I don't have a number. I know that Karen and Sarah are doing some numbers crunching on their end. Uh, I mean, it could change that we've got a million for housing and six hundred thousand for other evidence based programs. So, Senator, if I, if I could yeah. just um, we we we've been having this conversation since I arrived at Corrections around the, the domestic violence piece and. Um, I think um, my conversation with staff is, is that I, I, we saw that slide, I saw that slide, I've talked to David directly about this, and I think we've got to regroup internally and work in partnership with the network to figure out the most impactful way that we can do programming. Because I, I remember the ADAPT days from my, my police days, right? And, um, you know, that was pretty standard sitting on domestic violence task forces around the state. That was a pretty standard conversation that happened all the time. Um, I, we recognize that we're concerned about the fact that those, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily have programming right now that's reaching um, who we need to reach, especially outside. And, I, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't disagree that domestic violence is not just the violent act, but frequently right. it's alcohol or other substance abuse or mental health issues, or, you know, other things. So I don't have a problem with, with looking at the whole totality of it, but it seems like we've kind of, and also the fee-based model for many of them is impossible. It was, you know, I understand the need for buy-in, mm -hmm. um, and so maybe they should contribute, but if they can only afford $10, that's what they should contribute, not $45. Something else in this that we've talked a lot with Karen and Sarah about is that the standards um, for the programming in the community are set by the state's um, Council on Domestic Violence. And the, the anecdote that stays with me in, in when we first learned about this is that the fee-for-service model is too expensive for the people who are paying for it. Um, and then for the programs, not enough money. The example they gave was a county that I'm totally forgetting which one it is, where the, the consequence of not enough resources is that the the staff are not able to maintain the standards of their training and their evidence-based and evidence-informed practices that meet the, what the state's council is setting, and so they're at risk of being decertified. But then the county's in the, in the unfortunate position of saying, but this is the only program we have. That conundrum really, I think, illustrates why the current funding model without any state um, investment is unsustainable, but also how something like a statewide coordinator, I think Sarah and Karen testified to this, even just reestablishing that position, each step in allowing, in providing resources to those Thank programs you. where they can remain current on the training and the standards well. that are being set for them by that council. Um, so anyway, th those are some of the nitty gritty pieces, and I know that they're working to put together some specific number information. I don't want to go out on the ledge that I can't walk back from, but I think $400,000 is is plenty um, from our initial conversations with them, and then we'll, we'll keep trying to pull that together. We're also speaking in depth with Kim and Monica and folks at DOC to try to get more of a number on the risk reduction programming expansion um, so that that is a priority in whatever upfront investment can really be highlighted as well. I also want to um, also let you know um, Senator and Senators, that we, when we trained the domestic um, violence curriculum, the, the uh, active curriculum that was uh, agreed to both by the network and by the department, um, the department told the um, network that we would not compete with them in the community in the delivery of that curriculum. So part of this is that that the network wanted to deliver this curriculum through its um, domestic abuse providers and at the community level, 
And so domestic, uh, domestic violence offenders are still able to participate in our RP in the community and access that DV specific curriculum through the um, domestic abuse On the providers. Back page of this document is the behavioral health so, so I think connected there. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions about the DV? That, that's helpful, Kim, to uh, understand what happened. Um, I heard a different story, and that was that Spectrum said we can't afford on the based upon the grant, and we're not going to do it anymore. And, you know, <clears throat> Mark Larson, who was here as a representative, was also part of that Spectrum, employed by Spectrum in the DV battery intervention program. So did get quite a bit of attention. Are you good with us? I'm good. Well, uh, Annie and then Jeremy. Have they have any you? Yeah. I was trying to say it politely, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> the Senator asked me if I if I was really saying, are you done? Are we done with you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I may be done with you, Commissioner. <laughs> for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> but I'd really like to hear from Derek on the or or sure. Amy on the Amy. Sorry. Amy. Um there was an Amy uh, Super Bowl Sunday that, that hosted a party. I thought. <laughs> um, Derek, do you want to explain housing to us? It seems to get a lot of criticism. Um, we got a couple weeks. Um, we got about ten minutes. <laughs> I'd be happy Give to. Give us a low life, low low version. We actually heard at one of our meetings that the final justice reinvestment working group meeting from somebody and I think it said everything about it we needed to know which was probably announced that their program didn't allow uh, social media for 90 days of placement in that housing program and a lot of us turned to each other and said you know I'm not big on social programming myself but I think 90 days might be a long time for somebody who's been incarcerated coming out and we heard from others at that same day about policies regarding um, if you drink you're going to be out of here or you know substance abuse housing and sober housing if you have an MAT you can't be in this program so those are the challenges I think we wanted to look at is how do we fit and we put a, thousand, a million dollars at least proposing to be bought out. Yeah. Well, for the record, Derek Mio Dovnik, M I O D O W N I K, Community and Restorative Justice Executive with the Vermont Department of Corrections. Thank you for your attention to all of this and to the housing component of it. And allow me to thank our interim commissioner for doing such a fantastic job uploading all of this and representing our work so effectively, as well as our partnership with Council for State's Government, which has been uh, really fruitful. Um, so what I think I'm hearing, Senator, and please correct me if this is inaccurate, is um, uh, different pieces and illustrations, pieces of information and illustrations that suggest that um, that perhaps there's potential misalignment between the specific po uh, program policies that run transitional housing services as funded by the Department of Corrections and the population that we're trying to have served by them. And that some of those um, tensions or potential mismatches really are. It appears are. that many of the programs have evolved to change the way that the, the people who are no longer with it, maybe they were good programs for people that are no longer in the department. They've been diverted, they've been... Yeah. You know. I, I, I'm in agreement with you, sir. I think to, to your request of trying to frame this um, within the next couple of minutes, I, w I, w I would submit that when we look at the list of individuals who are eligible for release 
but their primary barrier to being released is, is housing, and I'm sure you've heard of us talk about this as the B1 list of, over time, that's the shorthand. Um, you know, stepping back, we see two distinct subpopulations on that B1 list, um, which the, as of the other day was at 131 um, folks. I haven't checked it this morning, is that probably about that? Approximately, and this was uh, 131. 131 individuals who the main barrier for being released since they hit their min was housing. Um, but when we dig into that, to give you just, I think, what hopefully will be a, a contextualizing picture of this, um, approximately, and these are approximations, I have not done a statistical count, but probably about 40% of, on any given day, that list, are folks who ha are convicted for sexual offenses and are awaiting release. And it is, as I think we all know, very hard to thread the needle between the conditions of release and the prohibitions uh, or the restrictions, if you will, about what would constitute appropriate housing and, and finding housing stock that, that aligns with that. So that's a population that tends to sit on that B1 list um, for, for quite some time. Um, conversely, that's a population that does not recidivate to as nearly a high degree. So when we are successful in finding transitional housing for the population who have been convicted for sexual offenses, we see fewer returns on revocations for that population. And that's a public myth that sex offenders are constantly, uh, you know, constant predators out there. Um, I think that you've probably heard, and well, from a correctional perspective, that's a population that, from a supervisory perspective, again, there are individuals that are going to be anomalies to this, but on a population level, our, our biggest challenge is housing there. And finding uh, housing stock, which gets into the challenge of how, how do we bring on private landlords into what is a public health problem, right? Housing is uh, a public asset that a lot of it is held privately. And so it raises an interesting policy and challenge for us of how, how does a public institution sufficiently influence a, a privately regulated market? And if any of you were landlords and you asked yourself, if I have an apartment to rent, would I rent, you know, who would I rent it to? And you know, that's a challenge. Um, the other subpopulation that we have on the few on the list are folks who've been released multiple times often and, and do make their way back. And I think that that gets into your question about what's happening with these programs? Why do we have a program that would uh, prohibit somebody from social media for you know, 90 days? And um, I think that speaks to the challenge of what for a long time has been the, um, the potential transformation of a congregate setting and the efficacy of a therapeutic community. And the theory of change there builds on collective efficacy. It says, you know, if I'm in a place where everybody's goal is sobriety and recovery, I'm going to be naturally held accountable to this informal authority that we're creating. And I do think that, that 15 and 20 years ago, the population who we were serving, the individuals were at a different stage of change. They were in a planning and in action maybe even a maintenance phase of their recovery, such that they could leverage support and accountability from one another in congregate settings. The individuals we are releasing now, in my perspective, and I'm not a clinician, I'm a housing administrator, but I believe they're in a pre-contemplative or maybe at best a contemplative stage of change. And so when we congregate folks who are that vulnerable in their own recovery, we can't leverage that collective efficacy and the 
promise of congregate settings is also the downside risk, is that they haven't necessarily all figured out how to implement a harm reduction approach such that if you've relapsed in a group setting, it's still safe for you and safe for the other residents and safe for the staff to be in that program. So unfortunately, we do have a lot of programs that while many people come through effectively, so it's not, that it's, an, it's not an all or nothing, what we know is the population that we serve who are coming out are coming out still very vulnerable to relapse, many of whom this is their second or third episode of release. The fact is, if you're making your way into a transitional housing program in DOC, odds are that that's not your first release. You've probably been put out to your moms and it didn't work. And then maybe another private residence and it didn't work. So our transitional housing population is in and of itself folks that's usually not their first time out. They're in and when they're in these congregate settings, the risk tolerance, because it's not just about the individual, it's about the broader safety of the program and the staff doesn't really have a place for that person. Um, I would, not knowing the specifics of the example you cite, I think that that's the con I think that that's the context under which you're seeing policies that adhere more to the abstinence model. Yeah. And what we know about harm reduction is that the effective strategies are predicated on an understanding that somebody will likely relapse and how can we optimize for stability and safety with the least collateral consequences possible. And the challenge for us is that in many of these, again, congregate settings, we don't have an option if somebody violates uh, these programs and finds themselves exited, emergency exited from the program. They don't have a place to stay that night. So, yeah. Well, typically, I get an email, a letter, or an email from a mother or sometimes the person who's gotten kicked out of a program because they went off the porch mm -hmm. to talk to somebody in a vehicle. Mm -hmm. Now, the allegation is that's a violation of the rules, and it makes me, you know, when I see that, I wonder, mm -hmm. you know, having run a program for mm -hmm. years, I'm wondering why you need to kick the person out for that mm -hmm. or some other strategy that could be used. So that, I'm yeah. kind of curious about that. But on the other hand, that person now back in jail, mm -hmm. sometimes 90 days to six months, and they're mm -hmm. on what do you call intercept or whatever. Yeah. Now they're back, you know, it's another failure. Yeah. And they frequently just give up. Sure. Yeah. I mean, well, well, well that sounds draconian. And I would hope that we have programs that wouldn't literally, and you know, again, there tend to be varying narratives from different perspectives well, I, I about why. However, but, but, um, but I think I think the broader the point problem. being that the more you congregate, the more that rules, however granular, often have to be enforced with the greatest degree of consistency, because then any violation has a signaling value. And that signaling value is to the other residents in that program that says, oh, OK, so the porch rule is, in fact, really squishy. Let's check out the curfew rule. Oh, well, the curfew rule, I came in a half an hour after curfew. All right, no big deal. So the, the, the challenge with congregate sites is you have to apply, or I, would, I believe that the program administrators on the, on the community side feel that the only way to create a safe and responsible environment for the totality of the staff and residents is to set rules with a degree of rigidity that provides a structural integrity. But any time you look at a granular level about a decision like that, it has the potential to look somewhat absurd. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why our scattered site housing solutions tend to optimize for stability, because those are things that the Department of Corrections would 
exit somebody from their own housing for. And the challenge to finding that scattered site housing is that it either needs to be master leased by organizations and or facilitated so that the offender him or herself leases those. And so it gets into how do we permeate the private housing market in a state with a less than 1% vacancy rate for a population that is generally not exactly the <coughs> most appealing to most private landlords. And that's where we are faced with truly a public, NGO, and private uh, you know, collaborative challenge. No. So of those, of the B group group 131, yes. do you know how many of those are sex offenders? Well, my last count, and again, I did not do a forensic count, but it looked to me about 40% of the 131. Of the 131. So I'm going to do some rough math. That would probably put us at about uh, 60 or so. I could be off, you know, by a standard deviation, of maybe 10%. Well, let's no. just say it's 60. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'm turning to my colleagues to see if I'm off base on that. Yeah, I'll spend some more time on that. Let me use my so, yep. No, it's quite. It's, it's, it's somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. I mean, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it, and it's it's like it was 50 now. Yeah, it's between 30 and 40. But yeah, we can give you the exact number. What yeah, is it to be about 40? Between 30 and 40. Between 30 and 40, not 40 and 50. Correct. Okay. So even if 30 percent are sex offenders, they're difficult to place. Mm -hmm. um, the community here is sex offender. Do you want one living next to you? With your family, with the young kids. Even a family without young kids. So it, it is interesting well, that, that people are troubled by it. I, really I didn't disagree with you. No, I just, no, no, I no, just no, said it's really hard. No. Well, no. But, but so Senator, Senator White. So I had just a couple comments, and I think that um, one, one of the one of the problems is the perception. Absolutely. And I don't know how you change that perception. It's, um, I, get, I get notices. Don't ask me why on earth I get these notices, but I get a notice that says a sex offender has been placed in your community. I don't ever remember signing up for anything mm -hmm. like that. I don't want to know. I never check it out. I never look at the picture because I don't really care. Um, I mean, not that I don't care, but. I, so how do we change that perception? And then two other uh, things that I think that public housing or subsidized housing, that is, if it's subsidized by the federal government yes. in any way, yes. if you're on a lifetime registry, you do not you're, qualify, that is period. Right. That is right. And I think that that, of course, we can't change those guys in Washington, but we, we, should, yes. we should try to make some changes and talk with our, I work for housing authority. Great, do some housing authorities also impose those prohibitions? Well, they have to. On their own? No, they you have to if they're to getting- To get insurance seven. for the properties sometimes that- Not the, the public housing authorities have got to because they have, they're getting federally funded, yeah. so they have to. But the other thing is, is that with our um, vacancy rate of 1%, we have people on, in my, where I work, we have people on a waiting list for Section 8 housing that have been on the waiting list for five years. So it's really hard to say we should be providing transitional housing when we can't provide housing for people who are desperate. Anyway, it is yes. a real problem. Well, one of the it's, measures is to educate that not all sex offenders are created equal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like not all. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. we have differences and there's different levels of I thought of riddle and a different level of I mean, <laughs> I thought all people were created. Yes, I got a silly boy. Mm -hmm. That came out that, that did not come out the way I intended. <laughs> 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 Sex the variable risk profiles uh, repeat that, that all people are created equal. However, there are various risk profiles for all people, and particularly with sex offenders. So mm -hmm. some of them are more dangerous than yes. others, 
to the different population. Mm -hmm. But when you get down to an individual basis, who oh. wants to court a certain amount of personal risk Right. for the greater good, you know, ultimately this is an individual risk versus greater good proposition that has a critical dependency on the private housing market, yeah. and that's a hard place to be. The next to last word, then, Joe. I was actually going to, uh, Cassandra on the phone was going to say something, so. Okay, I'm sorry, Cassandra. Go ahead. Oh, she's Hello, hello, community members. I just wanted to mention that the recommendations around housing are focused on helping DOC to expand access to different types of housing options, including supportive housing. And so to double down on what Derek was talking about with that group of 131 people, 40% who are part of, um, uh, who are convicted for sex offenses, and then 60% who are kind of in that category of um, on the road to recovery. Supportive housing is a really great housing model for those folks. I know Pathways has been a housing option that DOC is working closely, closely to be able to get sex offenders out um, and into housing. And when thinking about the challenges around congregate settings that Derek was flagging, um, Pathways supportive housing model uses scatter site approaches, um, which helps um, to be able to keep those folks in the community. Um, so just wanted to, to flag that, um, those recommendations and how they're aimed and designed to try to address some of these challenges that VOC is facing with reentry um, and housing. Thank you. So, yeah. Well, the department has 50 vacant beds. 50 vacant beds? Yeah. That's, that's it's in Johnsbury. Oh, okay. Johnsbury. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Con congregate beds. <laughs> if we, if, if there were fifty uh, single uh, room occupancy apartments, we could uh, probably fill those and maintain people in them immediately. I th thanks for bringing that St. Jasbury conversation yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. I said thanks for bringing that St. Jasbury conversation up. Yeah. Well, um, it's, just, it's important but, to remember yeah. that. You know, that they're there, they exist. We can supervise to individualized risk when people are in individualized housing settings, I think is the point I'd like folks to understand. We sacrifice some ability as a department to supervise to individualized risky behaviors when they are in congregate settings because there are other primary and critical dependencies and immediate stakeholders in that house that the Department of Corrections, you know, is then, um, uh, you know, has to share our, our public safety overarching concerns with more of the more immediate house concerns. And so, that's why it does more than just uh, Corrections population. Yes, they serve, they serve the mental health population. They, they said they needed 360,000 to expand the Bennington County, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, they're only in six counties right now. So. Yeah, and I would. It's not clear to me, you know. Whether that's, you know, sometimes we fall on our swords for certain programs that seem to be the answer for this week. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that they're the answer for all of our programs. Mm -hmm. Well, they use a housing first model. And my point to that, respectfully, would be that housing first does say any of your efficacy to make behavioral change, if not anchored in housing stability. If you are in the existential crisis of not knowing if you're one bad decision away from losing your housing, you are fundamentally compromised in your self-efficacy, your ability to manifest those other changes. So if we can start from anchoring people in housing, we can at least clear the space to then make targeted interventions relative to the risks they propose and not have collateral consequences bound up in your housing. And, that, and that's housing first. And uh, the, our, our department supports that. When the, when the department contracts with providers, do they contract for a certain occupancy level, or do they just provide a contract of X thousands of dollars? 
So um, the procurement model that the Department of Corrections currently uses technically is grants, and I mention that because there are some differences between grants and contracts. Grants procure the, procure the organizational capacity up to a certain point. We do um, specify the number of beds, and then we uh, essentially set a floor of 80% um, utilization and when our data tells us that there is any trending for a grant that puts them below 80% for multiple quarters, then we begin to question what's going on. Have we over procured relative to demand? Are there other, you know, what's, what's preventing us from optimizing that? Uh, and that's part of our grant management process. So we have. We have a baseline, when it dips below that, that becomes a data flag that me and my staff, in concert with our local probation and parole management, um, start looking at you know, what's happening with this investment. Well, we've gone a minute over time. Senator Bruce, just report this. We're a minute <laughs> over. Um, so uh, we'll pick up here tomorrow. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you have thoughts for... Um, Thank you very much.